so you're ready to fire up a campaign in one of the greatest games ever made. But you're not sure which faction to pick. Well, I can help you rule out the Volandians right away. I've got a test that's 100% accurate for determining if you need to fire up a Volandia campaign. I'm going to count to three and then show you a picture. And you judge your excitement on a scale from one to ten and be honest. And based on that score, we're going to know real quick if this guide's for you. You ready? One, two, three. Now, if you're in the six to seven range, you know, you want to probably try Volandia out. You're really going to think they're cool. And then, you know, you can kind of go check out the other factions. But if you're in that like eight to ten range, um, I mean, you might be up late tonight playing a Volandia campaign. And let's be honest, it's probably one of many you've already played already. These Lego castle guys were the shit. They were the toys of men. That's what they were, and just awesome. And just like our brave Lego Knights taught us, my Valandian brothers, we shall conquer in the way of the Lance. Here's the perks of Valandia, a little more renowned from battles. I mean, that's hardly any. Uh, a little more money as a mercenary, which really is nice, and I'll explain why when we get to that point. 20% more influence to recruit army sounds bad. But it's, it's not. It's really not that bad. You get a ton of influence, and by the end game, when you're rolling with your massive army and fighting in massive battles, you're swimming in it. So don't worry about the 20% influence cost. You'll hardly notice it. Play whatever difficulty's fun for you. Or you could not be a big pussy and put it on Banner Lord, but the choice is yours. I'm playing Banner Lord every time. This is Lancelot de Leon. He's the shit. You can know that. And we're going to really build him into something fun. This is one of my most fun builds in the game. And that's how I play. I mean, if you want to min-max or whatever, there's always that. But uh, sometimes it's fun to really change up your build. The way I usually build my Volandian guy, I want to get my charge, damage, and uh, my riding all the way up. I want to become a monster on horseback and i'll show you it's so much fun but you also to really make the build pop i feel like you really need the skewer talent but you don't need much vigor to get up here i mean i think you can get up here with with just two but i have i happen to have three but don't sweat it whatever you have up here if you fill this up you're pretty much going to get the skewer it would be nice to get up to unstoppable force but Honestly, the polearm perks are kind of weird because they blend between helping cavalry and foot, and some of them aren't so needed. So, honestly, up to skewer is about where I like to go. And I start out right away getting my riding up. I think you need eight attribute points to get all the way to the end and get the, the bonus stuff. I think it's eight. Maybe it's seven. I don't remember. Go look at a strat guide. He'll tell you. But... I think it's eight, but either way, I'm going to go eight and two riding and make my guy just the supreme Lego Knight. And then down here, I put the other, I go eight into intellect so I can get my steward super high because I'm, this is going to allow you to live your, you know, last ride of the Rohirrim dream where you're going to have this super stacked cavalry army. And it's just awesome. That's what it is. It's just so much fun. And when you get to put it all together, uh, it's just a really good time. It's some of the most fun you can have in a game, I think. I, I just think they did such a great job with this game. It's got a long way to go, but I have a lot of fun just firing up these campaigns. So, without further ado, so Lancelot of House de Lion, we start out here outside the gates of Sargot. Now, the first thing that I like to buy is a little food. Ooh, that's expensive. Just a couple. You don't need much. But you are going to get some guys. Now, right here, I got three right away. If you're just starting out, just be careful and go slow. If Everybody wants to go super fast, but you can run into trouble that way. And if you're just starting out, don't be afraid to restart. But see, like that 19 there, we don't want any part of that. Now, if they chase you into a village, you can just click wait here, and they'll be off. And then you can get a guy. And just wait here until you feel like it's safe 
And then it's uh, careful leaving at nighttime because remember, you don't see as far on the map at nighttime. Now, the first thing we're looking for when we start out is a scout. So you want to visit every tavern. Just carefully want to move from village to village, trying to get some buddies. Oh, there's a hideout already. Excellent. That's excellent. And just remember around these hideouts, it's going to be high traffic area. So I wouldn't go through that pass or head that direction. Gee whiz, this is just... You want your first engagement to be extremely lopsided because you're going to take some casualties. All right, so our first engagement came out all right. I lost two, one wounded. What I love to do initially is just get a little group of crossbowmen going right away. One of the hardest things about fighting bandits is catching up to them. So let's talk horses for a second. Let me introduce you to the round seat. This is a horse that is used, and if you click on it, you'll see right here, used for increasing speed. So the more soldiers that you have in your army, the more rounds you'll need to make it move faster. But this basically mounts up your infantry or your crossbowmen on horses so you get speed. So you'll have to juggle your wages and keeping your guys fed, but as you can, sell your stuff and then weave in a rouncey or two and just slowly build up your rounds because that's going to give you movement speed, see, footmen on horses. And that number will slowly build up. And eventually, your mounted crossbowmen, you'll be able to catch uh, bandits very quickly, which is what you want to do. You want to get into a position where you're really just knocking them down one right after the other. That's when the money starts really rolling in. But at the beginning here, you want to be very careful. Select your fights. And just replenish your deaths and just be real careful chasing because this is this is how you get in trouble. They pull you into some other ones. And then another thing that's really great to do is if you see these little, there's one down here, uh, you know, up in these areas. If you can push groups up into these areas where they can't get out of, that can be a real good way to trap them early. And then you can get a hold of them. See what I told you about chasing? Damn it. Oh, uh, well, we'll see how this goes, but nice. Good job, fellas. That wasn't too bad at all. The big debate is always early game. Should you even upgrade from the level three ones to the level four? The nice thing about the hardened ones is the shield. The shield is a game changer. It protects them from incoming fire, javelins. You have them hold fire until the enemy's up close. You know, if they're holding fire, they're kind of just sitting out in the open with a sword. But if they are uh, holding fire as a level four, they've got this shield. Uh, it makes them way better in melee combat. I mean, it's a really nice upgrade. But don't feel like you have to do it. If you want to just stay here and play it safe, uh, it depends. For me, it depends on the game I'm playing. In this case, I've got a hideout real close. I've got tons of bandits close by. You know, money's pouring in. So once I get to a place where I've got enough money and I'm really rolling, I'll go ahead and throw some level fours in there. But for the most part, I'll stay at level three unless I'm really, you know, if I've won a tournament and I'm sitting on 10 large or something. So I won that big fight. I've got plenty of food, 10, 10 days until no food. And I've got all this money from selling all those spears and stuff. What do I want to buy? Some more rounds, because I want to get my group speed up. Now, leave a little bit for your wages, right? Because you're going to have a few days where you got to pay your wages. But as we build up our footmen on horses, that you can see our party speed's going up a little bit. And what you really want is you want 20 rounds and 20 crossbowmen. Now, on these 20 versus 6, this is where I'll already start simming. Because there's a lot of battles to be fought. And losing some level 3 crossbowmen really isn't that big of a deal. But if it's close like this, sometimes I do go ahead and play it out. Oh, my man. Oh, that's not good. Maybe spread out, fellas. If you're going to be killing bandits in an area, make sure you check the local villages and towns to see if it's got that hunting brigands down quest. Because if you're going to be killing them, you might as well get some extra gold for doing it. And I don't even like to touch... 
these hideouts until you get the quest for them because they'll just spawn brigands in the area and it really gives you a nice little farm spot. All right, I got all the food I need in my 20 rounces. And from here, I'm just going to keep attacking bandits and doing bandit quests or whatever. You can weave in some tournaments if you want. That's kind of fun to get some gear for your guy. Whatever you can do, but you can see how quickly you can really build this renown. If you're just going from bandit group to bandit group, you'll, you'll knock it out very quickly. And what, what I really like to do is I like to push to get to become a mercenary as quickly as possible. Now, the second you hit clan tier one, you want to get under a mercenary contract because what that's going to allow you to do is build up your war band on someone else's dime. Uh, I wouldn't even get too caught up in the number. I mean, anything over 200 is a pretty good contract. Uh, but like even now, I doubt I'll get that right now. Let's see. I only got 172 here, but that's fine. I've contracted to fight alongside the Western Empire. I think a lot of people like to go with the faction that they're playing with. Like they'll if they're playing as uh, Valandia, they like to merc up for Valandia. Sometimes I like to do that. Sometimes I also like to kind of do like I'm the jaded kid of a family that got exiled. And I'm going to go take my uh, family's lands back. So... There's a lot of ways to play it, but once you get your under your mercenary contract, the key thing to do is to get back to doing what you were doing. But you'll notice now when I kill bandit parties, my mercenary contract will increase. And the more bandit parties I kill, especially if you really kill them back to back, you're going to kick this number up. So now instead of losing money, I'm making money. But you don't want to go fight in big wars and stuff because your army sucks right now. It just sucks. Now, when we talk about composition of a mercenary troop, for my Valandian uh, mercenary army, I like to do, you know, right here we have up to 51 troops right now. So in this case, I'd probably do about 40, 35, 40 crossbowmen and the rest cavalry. I don't really start weaving in the infantry until I'm getting into those 100, 150 plus armies because the crossbowmen are good enough as infantry at the low levels. Uh, and at the if you're just fighting bandits and, you know, having those 10 knights run through and harass the enemy, I'll show you why I like them, but they're going through and just stabbing and, and, and causing mayhem and while the you know bandits or whatever are dealing with then your crossbows are just laying into them and it's a really great combo and you know you can feel free at this point to go ahead and level up your units another great benefit to the mercenary contract is it's going to help you build up your rouncy collection right the more troops that you get the more rouncies you're going to need to maintain that mounted foot troops speed so as we're, you know, going around killing bandits and selling the loot, we also want to be buying our rouncies to keep our movement speed up. And watch. See how my mercenary contract's 172? I send this battle, take out these bandits, grab all that loot. 344. Buy more troops, buy more rouncies. And you just keep this mercenary money coming in. The key thing is to not be losing money. Once you get a bag, what I'd like to do is start working on my guy. And the first thing you're going to want is a really good horse. And the big thing you're looking for on a charge build is this stat right here, charge damage. Go ahead and, you know, get yourself some gear too. And then we're just back to that grind. Another type of horse that might be really helpful to carry with you, especially as you start getting into raiding or fighting big armies and the loot gets bigger and you're getting huge stashes of food and perhaps uh, trade goods, just all types of stuff starts flowing into the bags or these saddle horses. So where rouncies right here, it says, are used to help increase your speed. These saddle horses will help you carry more weight up here. And these will increase your inventory space. So as these come in, these are really nice to add and to have a few of these in the old inventory to help uh, you and your guys carry their shit around. Another thing to remember is that the fastest way to level your steward is to have a lot of diverse food types so your troops are eating very well. 
So as you can afford it, make sure you're picking up some different food types if you're uh, selling and buying stuff in town because every time, see right there, I got three skill points, especially early, those various food types really start getting you leveled up. Charis is another great place to buy horses because just like Ostacon, it has a village that's primary production is horses. So just a good place to uh, look out. If you're on the lookout for some Rouncies or some war horses to upgrade your knights, Charis and Ostagon are two good places to check. Once you have 50 to 60 guys, you really can start trying to take on some either smaller parties that just won, but they barely won. Or you can use the terrain, like I said, and they really have a hard time. But you just got to be patient and close with them slow. Oh, that sucks, dude. Another great way to level up your little mercenary army is to raid. Completing a raid gives you a huge boost in your mercenary contract. You get all the loot from raiding the village. You get to fight the villagers, which is going to give you some XP and some loot. There's really just no downside to pulling off some raids as a mercenary. Just be careful because eventually they'll send a big army your way. And this is where having those saddle horses is really going to help carry all this loot back. You do tend to pick up a few mules. They also carry weight. Oh, look what I found. A heavy night lance. And you'll see where it says couch lance and 39 pierce. And 198 link. This is a great lance. And you kind of just wrench repeat that during mercenary mode. You go hit a raid. You go hit a party. If you can trap a caravan up in the mountains or something, go ahead and take that too. But don't be afraid just to go village to village getting your loot. Now, at a certain point, your army will be built up enough. And look, when you've got 50 or 60 guys, especially once they're leveled up pretty well, I've still got a lot of rookies in the old army here. And remember, these you know AI groups are going to have a lot of recruits in them too, especially if they've been at war for a while. So as long as you don't bite off more than you can chew, and then you just come through here and start leveling that lance, baby. And what you do is you just build up to speed, you hit X to drop that couch lance down, and then you just run through. And you can see the lance hit takes someone out, but there's a lot of damage being done just by running into things. And as you get better horses and better armor, and you really get that charge damage up there, you'll start doing a lot of damage that way. Now, the second you hit Clan Tier 2, you are available to be a vassal. The, the drawback, of course, is you're losing that sweet mercenary contract. The benefit is you can start building influence so that you can start taking over towns and getting, you know, fiefs and things like that. But there's going to be a gap between you losing your mercenary contract and you getting a productive fee for a fief that you want and building it into a real money maker. And, uh, you know, garrisoning it and providing food. And there's just going to be a lot of expenses. So, you know, get yourself a nice cushion. But whenever you feel comfortable, and don't be afraid to make a mistake, I suggest you go ahead and become a vassal as quickly as possible. And, you know, even if you're losing a lot of money, as long as you're pretty active on the map, you're going to be okay. So I'm going to go up to Garyos here. Pledge myself a vassal. And so now I'm a vassal, which you can see. And as if he heard me talking, he declares war on the Vlandians. Now, this is where it gets tricky because you need Vlandian troops. You're trying to build a Vlandian army. And remember, every time your clan tier goes up, you're going to be able to get more troops. So I've kind of got to come behind enemy lines and build up an army. So I'm a vassal at this point. Here's where my build is. I haven't been doing a bunch of combat because I've been simming a lot, trying to get forward to, you know, different parts of the guide to show you. Here's uh, the pole arms coming up, the writing's coming up. You see that I'm going heavy in steward. I'm keeping that diverse food uh, so that my steward's just leveling up consistently. 
going to go ahead and start getting my medicine rolling because I really, really, really enjoy uh, keeping my nights up if I can. You can just set your crossbows up on a hill. Now, remember, you don't have many shots with the crossbows, so I kind of like to hold them until I see the whites of their eyes, as they say. And as you're moving your guys up, don't be afraid to send the knights. Go ahead, just send them in. Take out the opposing cavalry. I like to kind of punch with the cavalry first. Bring up the crossbows. Get the infantry in position to flank. What I like to do is get, run my cavalry behind them there, and they're going to run, run, run. And then we have it. Now they're going to charge into them. And here comes the loving. And then you can just join the fun getting your couch lance on. Just get up to speed. You see the icon by the shield down there in the lower right. You can ride with your boys. And you guys could just have a grand old time. And at the end, you send in the recruits after you've hit them with the crossbow bolts and the, you know, softened them up with all the charge damage. You send in those recruits to earn their three coins. You're not paying them three coins to sit around and watch. Now, look here, this banner of the Squire, fantastic for this build. And there's another one that actually gives you 30% charge damage. But this is a really nice piece of loot for our charge build here. Just look for targets of opportunity. But the second you can start farming these armies is really great for a few reasons. Number one, the loot is great. They've got the war horses you need to upgrade your guys. Uh, you can take some of their guys as prisoners. You can release them so you can start building your rep up with the Valandia houses that you're probably going to want to recruit a lot of uh, as you build your own kingdom. And I mean, you know, it just the list goes on and on. People always are hesitant to give up that mercenary contract. But as you can see, I'm not hurting for money. I'm losing 900 a day with this army, and it's no problem. I haven't even gone back and sold what I've got on me, which is probably another 40K. So you're getting money very quickly. And uh, not to say that it can't get tight during peacetime. All right, looking good. I just got this castle. If you get a fief, I really cannot recommend enough that you make sure that you've got the Siege Workshop level three up. Level three walls and Siege Workshop, you are gonna be unstoppable. And then immediately after you've got the Siege Workshop, gardens and granary. And this is where having all those crossbowmen built up is really nice because crossbowmen are amazing at siege defense because remember if you're defending in a siege you have infinite ammo their big drawback is their limited ammo capacity and uh, especially when they're on those tier three walls shooting down i mean just nightmares of sieging valandian castles and towns because the crossbowmen even the militia crossbows they just do a ton of damage to armored units so we're going to go ahead and put some sharpshooters in here and then we'll get back on the recruiting trail. When we're talking about the Valandia tree line, that they do have this cavalry branch where you get these Valandian vanguards. And these are good cavalry. They really are good cavalry. They're not that bad. But honestly, I pass on these. So if you see Valandian light cavalry or cavalry or vanguards, just know that while they're good, they're not quite as good as these banner knights. You recruit these noble troop lines from castle villages. So villages that are attached to castles have a chance to spawn these noble troops. And then you can upgrade them uh, into the banner knights, which these are just amazing on the charge. Crazy, crazy fun. Reminds me of those Lego knights. But do beware that in the Valandian tree, you know, they do have this separate cavalry. And look, if you're just trying to get the numbers or you just need cavalry to fill in the gaps, these will do. They're not bad. They're just not banner knights is all. And then the Volgiers over here, this is your two-handed unit. Uh, they fight with the polearm and they are just so good, especially behind the sergeants. And uh, especially if you run the RBM AI mod where the, and the AI is really good about keeping that shield wall up. And these guys are behind them just cleaving things down. Really a powerful unit. Doesn't get its props. Also comes with these throwing axes. So kind of fun to use. 
and of course the sharpshooter we discussed. They say the big drawback with the sharpshooter is the ammo, but with that shield, you can get them in range and just soak ammo for a little bit if you need to. Uh, they're very well armored. They do crazy damage, and if you get a captain with uh, high crossbow skill to even buff them up a little bit more, they're incredible. Absolutely incredible. And in siege defense, I don't think there's a better unit. A lot of people shy away from wanting the castle early. They just want the town, but I actually kind of like it. First off, I love the location. It's by the water. I get this nice, you know, ocean sound going the whole campaign. Beautiful. It's very thematic, right? I take back this, you know, border castle, build up my troops, and then I go back and revenge Grandpa. Love that part of it. But on the practical side of things, defending sieges is a great way to fight huge armies and get a ton of influence, which is going to allow me to finally build that big army I need. One of the hardest things to do is once you drop off all your high-level, you know, crossbow guys and stuff in your new fief, your castle, your town, whatever you got, now you got to rebuild your army. So one of my favorite parts to the steward tree is right here, both giving hands and paid in promise. The first one here, paid in promise, allows you to, instead of you, you know, collecting armors, uh, it will turn that armor value that you would have c collected into an experience. So you, you hand it out to the troops, they get extra money, they work a little harder. Okay, so... That does it with armors, and if you come up here, uh, this does it with weapons. So the armor and weapons. Now, you know, you still get all the food, and you still get the horses and all that stuff, which ultimately, when you start fighting these big battles, will be plenty of loot on its own. But these two together are just probably two of the most powerful abilities because they allow you to get your army back in tip-top shape in no time you'll see an experience value down here that the loot now if i take the loot that goes away if i take say the armor that you know it cuts it in half but if i don't take any of the loot you can still come over here and take the you know grain and stuff you'll see it that doesn't do anything so you'll want to grab you know the food also grab the horses. I think saddles might actually count as part of the experience, but not much. When you're at peace in your neck of the woods, you're going to be tempted to run over here where the war is because you're going to want some of that sweet loot. But be very careful because if you're over here and this one pops off, you may not get back in time to defend your feet. So we're setting this up to be defended. It's tough to be patient, but just let it come to you. As was predicted, we're under siege. The Valandi is trying to take their castle back. When we talk about thief defense, there's a few things to consider. First off, the easiest way to defend a thief is to be outside of it. And then when an army comes to take it, and while they're setting up siege, you use your influence, right? You're going to come into kingdom, armies, and you create an army. Um, I can't do that because I'm inside the castle. And that's a great thing to do because you can see the size of army you're going to need. And remember, even if you can't summon a, an army bigger than the army that's sieging your fief, as they lay siege, they'll begin to take attrition. So, you know, as they get into a, a, a number range you're comfortable attacking, then you can hit them. Uh, that's probably the safest option. The downside to that is... You spend all your influence defending your fief, but if it's a fief you really don't want to lose, that's probably the safest option. The other option is this, where I was given this castle, I didn't really spend anything to get it, and I'd like to hold on to it. If I lose it, it's not the end of the world, but I'm going to go down swinging. As you set up your siege defenses, you can pick between ballistas or catapults. I really like catapults, but they take a lot longer to build than ballistas. And the best thing you can do is have four things up. Join the defense, and as I hit play, you'll see these start to fill up. You'll see they'll get their siege camp set up, and then I'm building siege engines... Pretty soon they'll have their seat. There it is. And now they're going to start building rams and stuff. And because of that siege workshop level three, look, I've already got these out. Now what you can do is you can pause it. Once you've got everything up and you can move some of these to reserve and start building some ballistas if you want. And that way, if you get into a big siege duel, 
you've got things in reserve to pull out. But the second they start building these onagers, move that to reserve. You want your big boy stuff out here ready to go. Now, the AI never puts its stuff in reserve, so it really has a hard time countering your siege. Oh, see, it got one of mine right there. And this is where that level three workshop look is you're going to get into a duel where you're building siege engines and hurting each other's siege engines. Okay, now they're attacking. So they're going to have one siege engine up and I'm going to have four. This is a disaster for them. Okay, because the siege engines are really what make or break a siege. And you'll see. The start of the siege is set. Now what I want to do is get off my horse and get up to one of these siege engines as soon as possible. So I can start using the siege engine to level my engineering very quickly. These siege engines put out a ton of damage. And as you'll see as this siege goes on, and I'll just kind of link some highlights here. Hit me, hit me, my man. Really trying to get those siege engines down early. Look at that. Up to 60 in engineering in one lock. It's crazy. And here's another thing. I like to really get to hitting their archers down because, boy, these will landing and crossbowmen really hurt your guys. See that? That's the power of these mangonels. They just, or whatever, onagers, whatever they're called. See, they knocked that siege tower out. And now on these level three walls, they got to climb real high under just pretty much nonstop crossbow fire. Now, at the beginning of the siege is always when you're going to take the worst casualties. And this is what I'm saying. If you can knock down their archers like I'm doing here. Oh, look at that. Oh, man. And this is kind of one of the big benefits to posting up a nice defense because it takes a whole army of the enemies off the map. And then here your army comes to kind of protect your castle, but you held. And so, you know, I haven't been able to rebuild my army. I refilled up my garrison. But look, I got all this influence from winning the battle. I made a ton of money. I haven't been able to sell uh, everything I've gotten yet, but I got a ton of stuff to sell the second I can, so my money situation will be good. And look, I got 138 in engineering just from that one siege, so I can come through here and really start building up my character. One of the things you'll wanna make sure of is that randomly the AI will throw you thieves that you have no interest in whatsoever. So like this one, I got this castle. I don't want this castle. Plus, I don't wanna have a lot of thieves. I already have one. Me taking it will influence me getting it, but if I already have a bunch of thieves, he'll give it to someone else. So you can just come in here. If he gives you something you don't want, give it back, they'll vote on it. Remember, we're just saving our influence to build a huge army to take back Grandpa City. Okay, slight change of plans. Uh, I tried to get the vote my way on Charas, and I just can't. And I, there's, for the life of me, I cannot get them to start a war. But they did start a war with the Vlandians again, which is fine because uh, they're pretty weak. They're in a big bet. They're in two other wars at the moment. They've been fighting for a while. And uh, Jaculin here is a awesome city. If you don't know, this city has four villages that connect to it. It's just very, very wealthy city, and you can get extremely wealthy with all the food that comes in. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and make a move for that. So what I do, you come into kingdom. Uh, right when they declared war, you come in and hit this create army, and then you create your army. You come in, and we're going to just come up, and we'll get started on the siege as uh, the rest of our army moves towards us. That way, by the time they get here, we're ready to go. Now, we're going to click on Besiege Town. We're going to want all of the goodies. So, two Siege Towers and a Ram. And then we'll build some Onagers out here up front. Now, let's talk about offensive sieges for a second. If you just run at these walls while they have all this siege equipment up and all you have is these siege towers and ram, you're going to take horrific casualties. You need to knock some of this stuff down to prevent your army from just getting clapped. 
The best way to do that is obviously just to counterattack it and knock them down. And then once you've knocked them down, then attack. However, you'll notice that theirs are already set up and yours aren't yet. So the way around that is you're going to build one. And the second it's built, you're going to hit pause, pause, and then you're going to move it to reserve. Now, they're going to get one round of volley at it and they might hit it a little bit. Pause, move to reserve. And then once this volley goes off, okay, we pause it. And now what we're going to do is we're going to pull all of them out at one time. And you can see some of them, this guy over here already took some damage. And now we're going to have a siege engine duel. And that was a pretty good, looking good so far. We're getting hit, okay. And once all of their siege engines are down, now here's something I like to do. They're rebuilding this one. They'll get that up. Move one of these to reserve. And what I like to do is go ahead and build one ballista because it's very fast to build. Hold on. And so I've got three catapults and a ballista. We've knocked all their siege engines down. You could knock these walls down. The problem is then you have to rebuild them. And I don't want to have to do that. Do you think these are what? Are these level two walls? Oh, they're only level one walls. I could have just hit them already. We've got their siege down. My siege is up. Everybody's ready to roll. They've got pretty good numbers, but remember a lot of this is just militia and uh, it's not that effective. So it's game time and we're off. Jacqueline shall be mine. Let's do it, Oklahoma gang. Go up there and kick ass and take names. And then when they start bringing up the infantry, this is what I really like the uh, ballista for is because then you can start taking off, you know, packs of guys on the wall two at a time with this thing sometimes. Sometimes even more than that if you get a real nice shot, but you usually can grab you at least two and just start sending them. And you can see my engineering over there in the left is just rolling up every shot. Oh, I'm down. And look, these get really ugly. Geez, that's a lot of red. Oh, that's a lot of red. But there was some green. There's some green. There we go. No victory without sacrifice. Oh, my God. There it is. And as you can see, we paid for it. 355 dead. Almost 200 wounded. Brutal. And now I'm the new owner of Jaculin. And I've got this awesome city. You'll see you really start to make a lot of money once you get a city. And you'll definitely start to make a ton of money when you build it up, uh, this one could be upgraded quite a bit. So again, the first thing I come through and do, I'm taking all this off. I'm putting some money in the reserves, maybe like 20 grand. Okay, and then I'm building this siege workshop into my orchards are already done, into my granary every time. These three, and then I start building the rest of the stuff, maybe build some fortifications. Do watch your loyalty. If it gets too low, they'll rebel. And this is a great time to buy your workshops. I love to buy workshops in the towns that I own. Taking cities is the backbone of uh, an empire. And these big cities, especially these very wealthy ones that you can really, if you build them all the way up and you just give them time to prosper, they get to become just huge sources of income and really, really, really the backbone of your empire. And that's it, family. You just save your money, spend your influence wisely, protect your fiefs, and once you're strong enough, you can build your own empire of awesome looking knights. Let me show you the build. This is kind of where my build's out at this point, but you can see I'm trying to get that steward as high as I can. But got my pole arm up here to skewer. My riding is through the roof. And, and this is just such a fun build. You just load up in the battle. We'll get the uh, crossbowmen to come up here and fire some rounds into them to see if we can't provoke them out here into the open. Because that's what we want. And you can see they've got a ton of cab and I've got a ton of cab. I like to go ahead and just kick it off. Cab on cab. Those banner knights aren't going to lose for you, family. Every time they're going to do you right. I promise. Look at them. Growing me a Christmas tree in the upper right corner with all that green. Are you kidding me? Look at them. Look at them. Oh my God. I love them. I fucking love them. 
We get my boys here. Now I'm backing them out. Now that they've done the damage, pull them back. All right, so we bring our archers down, and we're going to see if we can't provoke them. We're going to bring the uh, row here. I'm around here. And you just send everybody in. You scoot the archers nice and close so that if they just sit back here and look, and then you can just get in here and start having fun, family. This is where the power of the charge build really comes in and these clumped up infantry. Look at the damage I'm putting out, even without... Justin, and your crossbows are out here dumping in rounds, right? You bring your infantry over here. To hell, just send them in. And then these... And you just keep charging through here. Look at that damage you're putting out. I don't usually switch to my one-hander ever because why would I? Obviously, you can see this would go a lot better in the open, and you can draw them out in the open. I'm just trying to give you an example of what it looks like at max build, but just so much fun to come to just drive through your enemies. And that's how it's done, kings. That's the way of the lance. Shatter your enemies with your couched killers. I hope this guide will help. I promise you, Volandia is a great faction, a lot of fun, and you're going to have a lot of fun. Get in there and get to harvesting. Oklahoma out.